to achieve SDG 2, zero hunger. I'm Catherine Cheney. I'm a senior reporter at DevX focused on technology and innovation, and I'll be your moderator today. So as many of you know, and I'm sure it's part of why you're here with us today, there is enough food to feed everyone on the planet, but hunger is still on the rise. And in fact, it's getting worse. Between 720 and 811 million people faced hunger in 2020, as many as 161 million more than in 2019, according to this year's State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World report. That same report explains how the COVID-19 pandemic has had devastating consequences for food security and nutrition. And that really raises the stakes of real outcomes at convenings like the upcoming UN Food System Summit. It also raises the stakes when it comes to seeing real outcomes from technology. And that's what we'll be discussing today. So detailed geospatial mapping can be an enormous resource in addressing food shortages, improving harvests, and tackling malnutrition. Effective applications of remote sensing and GIS, or geospatial information systems, can help when it comes to monitoring crop health, supporting the accurate targeting of irrigation and fertilization, and maximizing agricultural yields through precision farming, to name a few examples, and you'll hear more in a moment. But the benefits of geospatial data are often out of reach for smallholder farmers in low and middle income countries, and they play a critical role in strengthening the food systems that they and their communities depend on. So in this event, hosted by DevEx in partnership with Esri, we'll take a look at how geospatial data can be used to strengthen evidence-based decision-making in order to address issues of food insecurity, malnutrition, and climate change. And I wanna note that this is part of our DevEx at UNGA 76 program taking place all this week, as well as the first in a series of three digital events on ensuring that progress on the SDGs through GIS technology and geospatial thinking is not only possible, but actually um, happening. And, and how do we make that happen and work through the challenges that lie ahead? I'll ask the experts joining us to expand on successful applications of geospatial data to strengthen food systems, share what lessons they've learned, and also give their take on how the global development community, including those of you gathered here for this webinar, can further scale the use of geospatial technology. First, I wanna to head to a conversation with Clint Brown, Director of Product Engineering at Esri. I sat down with Clint to discuss the role that mapping and spatial analytics technology can play in tackling hunger. And thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Catherine. It's nice to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. So I'm, I'm very familiar with Esri's work, uh, but for those who are less familiar, your work on mapping and spatial analytics really spans the sustainable development goals. Today, of course, we're tasked with looking at the intersection of Esri's work and mapping and geospatial technologies more broadly as, as this relates to hunger. And so I wonder if we can just start broadly why are the tools that Esri produces, why are geospatial technologies more broadly uh, relevant and critical when it comes to fighting hunger? Well, thanks very much. That's a, that's a really great question. And, and what's, what's interesting about everything in the world is it happens somewhere. And location becomes this amazing uh, uh, mechanism to integrate information from all kinds of organizations. Many problems have multiple facets. Uh, the other thing that's really interesting about GIS is information comes as layers, is this idea that, that information can be shared across multiple organizations and coming to life. These past few years, the growth of GIS and the expansion of cloud computing has made it possible for all information around the planet to be accessible in an integrated way by many people. Yeah, absolutely. I'm typing as you go because uh, this is a definitely a field I follow closely. And one of the things I wanna get to in a moment is uh, the impact of COVID when it comes to GIS and mapping, because I think COVID has really um, put these technologies on the radar of a lot more people for the first time. 
Um, but before we get to COVID, I just want to make sure I understand the challenges, right? So, so when it comes to applying these technologies to issues like hunger, um, there's huge potential in terms of the role GIS could play with hunger, for example, but there are challenges. Um, so can you expand on, on what are some of the challenges um, GIS technology as we products have in really fulfilling their potential on zero hunger and how are you working to address those? So first, I think the, the, the biggest challenge is awareness. And, and um, that awareness is uh, GIS has actually come of age and it came of age in these last few years quite rapidly. Like we, we mentioned the coronavirus dashboard, that's a great example of this community GIS, the, the, the global community of information um, becoming integrated and, and shared and used by many. And that idea that people really by knowing the URL, the link to these information sets can begin to put those to work. So part of it is this uh, growing awareness, but it needs to grow more about, about the capability of GIS to work on these problems. Um, and also this recognition and kind of acknowledgement that the geospatial community is massive. There's 350,000 organizations worldwide, millions of people building content. In our cloud GIS, there's 45 million items covering the planet. So part of that is, well, how do you become aware of that? How do you discover and search? And a lot of that is about this idea of creating communities of practice, for example, around each SDG. So a community of practice for hunger is still <laughs> quite substantial number of people working on that, like the good work by FAO on locusts this past year is just a great example of that. Can you expand on that a little bit? Um, I, you know, I, I've, I've read a bit about the FAO's work on locusts, but I did want to ask you about a specific example that can help kind of ground this and ground this discussion in terms of the potential in what this looks like on the ground. So can you expand on, on how uh, geospatial tools have been critical in that work? Well, what's interesting is FAO has been actually working on that problem for 30 years. So it's not new to them, but what's new to them was their ability to um, apply community GIS practices to that problem. This followed pretty rapidly along the lines last year of the, of the COVID dashboards, like the one from Johns Hopkins. So that pattern became one that lots of organizations came to this realization that that same pattern for information technology could be applied to many problems across many communities, one of those being the FAO community. So they'd, they'd worked for a long time at developing this global network of, of desert locust responders from Western Africa to Western Asia. They, they've been collecting data in the field. They've been sharing and um, distributing that data back across these communities. And, and what happened with that data these past few years is the GIS technology and computing technologies in the cloud became powerful enough that these groups could use that information operationally, including in very remote areas, people that you wouldn't think have access to amazing technologies, but with their phones and with their mobile devices, they were able to do it. You know, many young people these days are, are digital natives and, and that, that kind of notion about how to put, put that information to work in new and novel ways has been a, a, a big, um, a big uh, initiative in, in the geospatial community worldwide. Now, I know, you know, a team like the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, for those who aren't familiar with the acronym, but I'm guessing this crowd is very familiar. Um, you know, the FAO has GIS specialists on their team, I'm sure, and, and you see this across many large development agencies. But um, I know one of the challenges here is, you know, making sure that, for example, smallholder farmers themselves 
can access these tools. So are, are there partnerships that Esri is exploring in that space in terms of um, making sure that these tools are widely accessible? Yeah, well, cit citizen science and citizen GIS has been one of those big trends. In, in a way, every, every person, and by the way, there were 2 trillion hits in 2020 of this Johns Hopkins dashboard, just the awareness of that and of people beginning to understand somehow maps, I think really speak to humans and help us see patterns that we might not otherwise uh, see or comprehend or understand. But that, that notion that, that GIS can be for everyone has been, I think, one of those big aha moments that happened in 2020. As bad as coronavirus has been, just that that kind of um, awakening of this global community of participants. Now, all of a sudden, it's a really interesting time as we go forward with these tools and these technologies. Absolutely. Well, you touched on how COVID has impacted this space um, of geospatial data, but COVID has also worsened the hunger crisis globally. And, and I'm curious, have you seen really in the past 18 months an uptick in the use of geospatial data for hunger specifically? Actually, we have. There's, there's another set of tools that we develop, and I'm sure many of your listeners will have heard of story maps. But um, this past week, because of this interview, I, I just asked for uh, what kind of story maps do we have about hunger from the past year? And it was stunning. There were, there were, uh, you know, within within an hour, the, our teams at Esri were able to surface uh, uh, close to fifty story maps that people around the world are doing across all these agencies, especially the UN agencies, uh, across the SDGs themselves. Um, many of these efforts are regional in scope, you know, like in certain countries in Africa, Senegal comes to mind to me as being one of those. But, but it, was, it was actually a pretty overwhelming number of, of uh, examples of communities really stepping up and, and just jumping into the problem of hunger. So Clint, uh, one last question for you. With the UN General Assembly underway, what is one thing the global development community can do when it comes to scaling the use of geospatial technology for the SDGs, for hunger specifically, and also for the SDGs more broadly? I think the best thing is for everyone to join. Pick, pick one of the sustainable development goals and join that community and become a participant in that community and most important, contribute. And I think a lot of us have information and knowledge that we can contribute to those things. Thanks so much, Clint. And I think there are some resources in the chat for those who are, of you who are joining us on Zoom where you can learn more. Clint, thanks so much for your time. Hey, thank you. All right, well, speaking of a community of practice, I see uh, for those of you joining us on Zoom, we have a question posted. Let us know who you are, where you're dialing in from, uh, what organization you're representing. And it's great to see some responses coming in from people all over the world who are part of this community of practice, whether it's uh, in the geospatial side or uh, the working to end hunger side or the intersection of those two issues. We have a really great group here. And I wanna note before I introduce our panelists uh, that I certainly have lots of questions for our panelists, but we really wanna make this interactive. So feel free to post in the chat if you'd like or in the Q and A function, what questions you have, um, whether you have some questions now or whether questions come up, I really wanna make sure to get to as many as possible. Um, so I want to go ahead and introduce our panelists. And one thing that I have mentioned to each of them is I want to make sure we walk away from this discussion, not just understanding the potential of geospatial data as it relates to SDG2, but real examples. You just heard that locust example. Um, real examples, real stories from uh, what this looks like. So I would also encourage our participants that 
beyond just questions, if you have stories to share, links to share, please post those in the chat. I know we can all learn from each other. Uh, but without further ado, I wanna go ahead and welcome Dr. Doug Machoni, Senior Environment Officer and Head of the Geospatial Unit at the FAO, which you heard a little bit about earlier. Sarah Muir, who's Earth Observation and Climate Analyst at the United Nations World Food Program. And Carolina Peters, who's the Mozambique Country Director for NCBA CLUSA, which is the National Cooperative Business Association Cooperative League of the United States of America. So diving right in, um, I'm really eager to hear from each of our panelists about some specific examples from your world. Um, so I'll start with Doug, if that's all right. Doug, uh, from what I understand, the FAO's geospatial unit assists countries in using geospatial solutions to create sustainable food systems. Sounds really interesting, and I think I have a sense of what that means, but I'd love to hear how does that actually work and what are some examples you can share with us? Sure, thanks. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's great to see so many people in the chat that I know. Um, hi. Um, so one, one thing about um, FAO, you know, we've been around for 75 years. I've been working in geospatial for 30 plus years, um, and we cover the whole gamut of from ag to crops to disaster, livestock, plant pests, water, irrigation, et, et, et cetera. And so there's, there's no silver bullet, although there's a zero hunger, um, it's obviously um, integrated. So your, your question about how does this work, um, it's interesting. Um, I have a really great job. <laughs> um, the phone rings or I get an email and saying, Doug, can you help us with this or that or the other thing? And it's, it's really a great position to be in. And um, an example, and I'm glad um, um, you and Clint brought it up, a desert locust. So I've been working with um, Laura Pradas at WFP. Uh, we met through the UNGGIM, even though we were in Rome um, overlapping for three years, we met in New York. And, um, and so she calls me and said, um, hey, um, can we work together on desert locust in Eastern Africa? And I said, sure, I mean, that's what I do for a living. And um, so she brought her team over to FAO um, in my lab. And um, we did this analysis and it, it was really great. And it really points out that the, the power of cooperation because we were just being so redundant. Like why are you downloading the Sentinel and the Landsat and processing it and such, but also it was the cooperation. Um, and so, um, you know, there, there are numerous examples. Um, I, I get these calls, it's really great sometimes. I mean, I now know more about rice than I ever thought I would know. I mean, I always thought there was white rice, brown rice, and basmati. Oh, no. Um, and the same thing with avocado. I get a call, you know, can you help us with avocado production? Well, it is not as simple as all that. We can use our agroecological zoning. You can see my background there, a little plug, um, you know, to say where it is um, good land for production of avocados now and in the future using uh, ensemble climate models. However, then you have to get into the whole markets and the certification and the nutritional value of, um, of all of these different avocados. I just thought there was one type. And um, so um, in, there, I, I think we're all moving towards this more integrated um, holistic analysis. We used to call it integrated landscape management. I don't know what we call it anymore. Um, but um, if, for example, working in Abu Dhabi, um, and working with them on developing a master plan for sustainable agriculture. It's truly multi-sectoral, um, bio, energy, soil, water, energy, climate, food, nexus, and, and, and such. And so one of the things that we do is we take from these examples um, and we, we try to um, call the, the, you know, the, the best ones and say, okay, this is something that, that we can replicate in, in another context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are some great examples. And I think, um, for example, when it comes to agroecological -ecolo zones, uh, plugged in your background, as you said, it, it kind of goes back to what Clint was saying, everything happens somewhere, right? 
And it's also, there's so much complexity involved in these issues. It's not only about place, but these layers of information that need to be considered. Um, so whether it's desert locusts or um, you know rice or avocados, uh, the location matters, various layers of information matter. And I think these tools can help um, bring that all together. So thanks for sharing some examples. And then another thing is the cultural aspect of it, because as the countries um, transform, and, and modernize in certain ways, they, they still want to maintain that their cultural identity, uh, which is very important, obviously. Absolutely. I hope we can hear as well from Sarah and Carolina how that cultural aspect comes into your work. That's a great point. Um, Sarah, I do want to bring you into this. And, you know, I mentioned you work with WFP. Specifically, you manage WFP's asset impact monitoring from space service, which I actually wasn't familiar with prior to preparing for this session, but it sounds very interesting. And I wonder, can you just talk us through um, what are the processes, what are the partners involved when it comes to leveraging satellite imagery in WFP's work? Yeah, absolutely. So the AIM service, um, we're, um, like many of our colleagues here, we're leveraging the power of satellite imagery um, in order to monitor WFP projects from space. Specifically, we are monitoring our flagship program called the Food Assistance for Assets Project, that program, sorry. And uh, here we're really using proven, the key is that thing is that we're using proven and well-tested methods and applying this to available satellite data. Um, and there are two main processes in, in the service offerings. Um, the first, we are using commercial satellite imagery to firstly identify, yes, we can see that the project is active, it's been implemented. And then we monitor this over time to say, um, halfway through the year, it's still there, the next year and so forth. So it's being maintained, which is immensely valuable, um, especially for those projects where WFP has moved out of that area, we can still look back and say, look, WFP's uh, initiatives, they're still ongoing and being maintained by these uh, communities. The, the second process, I'm kind of um, uh, summarizing a little bit, but it goes uh, a step further. So we're not just identifying that that project is there. We are also looking to see, is there a positive impact that this project is having on the landscape? And this we're using open source satellite data time series data to look at the long-term trends to say yes this year once we implemented the project there has been a significant improvement at the site compared to previous um, so those are the main processes involved and then in terms of um you know partners that we're working with esri is really a key player here um, because we need to make all this evidence that we're generating uh, to do with um, the asset creation, we need to share it with our colleagues in the field office. So last year we moved online to a platform and we have an interactive platform that is completely ESRI based, where the users are able to interact dynamically with the satellite imagery at the asset site, um, which is much more um, useful than just viewing a static map. There's that spatial context that you otherwise might lose. And you can estimate, you know, um, in the project details, we have the expected impact area, um, but we can also estimate this directly on, on the platform. Um, yeah, so that's just a little bit about the, the processes involved in, in AIMS and, and also the main partner um, involved so far has been, um, has been ESRI. Um, but yeah, yeah a quick follow-up. So I wonder, I think that's really well put that there's value in um, having more than just a static map. Um, but can you give me a sense of, you mentioned users, uh, what kind of user are we talking about and what kind of variables can they adjust to see that further context and complexity beyond what a static map would give you? Yeah, absolutely. So at the moment, we are targeting this at, at WFP country office users, but really what our vision for AIMS is that this can be open up, opened up more broadly to potentially government and, and partners as well. Um, in terms of the functionality and the platform, so you're able to zoom right down to like the pixel resolution if you wanted to in the, the satellite imagery, and you can um, 
there are our aims analytical observations present there. So we inform the user, yes, it's present, no, it's not, more information is needed. And we include other descriptive pieces of metadata um, about that asset. So like the size, the implementation date, and, and that sort of thing. Great, really helpful, thank you. Uh, Carolina, I wanna bring you into this because uh, in doing research for this session, you know, FAO, WFP, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with ways they might use geospatial data in their work. Um, and then when I was reading about your work, I thought, that's interesting. There, there's a connection here between land tenure, food systems, and geospatial data, but that might not be um, as obvious to a lot of people how land tenure comes into this. So can you tell me a little bit more about um, kind of that chain I was just describing? How does GIS support land tenure? And how does land tenure support food systems? Sure, sure. Hi, um, thank you, Amy, first of all. Um, the way we, we, we started working with GIS systems, incorporating GIS systems in our work was that we were supporting, we we're supporting families in, in rural Mozambique obtain their land titles. And um, the system that is in place or the system that was previously in place, it's quite onerous, it's quite heavy. It involves, you know, people walking around with GPSs and writing down the coordinates and then putting that onto a computer and typing in coordinates, which then gets reported to the government and then the map is drawn up. So the way that we have bypassed that is by using an ESRI-based system and actually doing the mapping and connecting that map directly to the government's land registration system. So there's no need to do a GPS uh, route and a write up and then uh, transposing that into Excel and then passing that onto the government. So the system now directly feeds into the government system and expedites the process of land tenure for, for rural families and brings out the cost of obtaining said land, land title significantly because it's a lot, it's a much more simpler system. Um, we also have very strong data that says that once farmers have land tenure, they're much more likely to invest in production, um, improve inputs, and also in protection of their soils. Um, so that has obviously led to increased production and increased incomes to the families that we have supported to secure their land type. Thank you, Carolina. And I know we've talked a lot about satellite imagery, um, but my understanding is you're working with drone imagery as well. So can you talk about that? Sure, of course. Um, I, I think everyone, well, not everyone, but as many of you know, Mozambique experienced a very, very severe cyclone um, in 2019. And um, it was cyclone that died and it happened in the center of the country and impacted millions of people and, and pretty much washed out um, thousands of hectares of crops. And what we, we began exploring the option of, of, of drones for action provision because we weren't able to access the communities that we usually work with. So we were able to identify a drone vendor that allowed us to have access to the, to the communities that we work in and get images as to the conditions of crops in those areas. So the way we do this is that we collect, it, we collect the information through the drones. The drones are then analyzed by our agronomist, the, the images, and then we, we can identify where there's crops. Stress. Our extension officers go to the areas that are identified as experiencing crop stress. They identified what the problem is, either full army worm, which has attacked crop severely in this area in the last couple of years. And then we come up with technical uh, advice on how to deal with such problem tests or, or and the way we disseminate those messages is through radio, SMSs, and government extension services as long as as well as our own. Great, thank you, Carolina. And, and you're coming in a bit choppy for me at points, but I was able to follow everything you said. So I think I'm everyone sorry. was able to too. No, it's all right. It actually leads me to my first question and, and I will um, really encourage our audience. I'm so excited uh, to see what great engagement we have in the chat in terms of where you're from, but please, please do post those questions in the chat or in the Q and A um, and I will work to get to them. But I did wanna ask um, Carolina who is using her cell phone connection as a hotspot to dial in because of internet challenges. Uh, you know, we've all been there um, in various settings around the world. And, and it leads me to this question of connectivity being a challenge. And, and someone posted this um, in the chat. Uh, I, I saw someone posting from DC who represents a small NGO uh, in, in the Eastern DRC and mentioned um, cell phone coverage, the challenge of cell phone coverage. So basic cell phone coverage, Wi-Fi, um, 
when it comes to the potential of geospatial data and GIS tools um, in some of these markets that could benefit most from the use of GIS for you know, food systems and hunger, those are the same markets where there's often challenges with cell phone coverage with internet connectivity. So have you encountered that challenge in your work and, and what partnerships might help to address that challenge? How are you working through it? And anyone who wants to jump in, I wanna make this a, a conversation. So I, I won't call on any of you, but how, how do we deal with that challenge? Carolina, maybe? No, I it can, if I can, because we have tangible experience in this. And the way we do this again is we, we eliminate the information or service the mapping through government extension services and and also Carolina speaking SMS. Of, I'm so sorry to cut you off. Can you try turning off your camera? Because as we discuss this connectivity challenge, I, I've lost you, but this should make it better. Go ahead. Okay, great. Sorry. That's better. No, what I, what I was saying is that, you know, our first line of dissemination to as in private sector and people do that have the capacity to obtain this in more, more sophisticated information. But then we dilute that and disseminate it through SMS and radio programs. Local radio are the most, probably the most effective way of getting messages out to, to rural communities. Um, so we don't rely on just in the maps out there and, and again, um, more sophisticated information. We break it down so that reaches the, 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 the most vulnerable and the people that really need that information the most. In, in ways that they can access. Again, SMS and radio, which is really effective. Thank you, Carolina. And, and feel free to turn your camera back on, but I, I'll just let you know if uh, you're cutting out because we could hear you more clearly there. Um, but really interesting. I had not ever thought of the connection between these resources and radio and how that might come into the mix, SMS and radio. Um, Doug, Sarah, any, any responses here in terms of connectivity, cell phone coverage arising as a challenge um, when it comes to geospatial data really living up to its potential in this space? Well, it has a, a, a lot of potential. I, I, I want to go, um, go back to um, the, the topic of the uh, land tenure um, and, and yeah. in, in consideration of, of um, gender equity, because um, this is, a, I mean, there are so many case studies of this, a, a, a woman farmer um, tractor breaks and she needs to get it fixed. And it's like, oh, well, I'll just go down and get it fixed. Well, I don't have that extra cash. Well, um, I have to take out a loan. Well, I actually, I don't have land tenure. I don't legally own it. And so we're hoping things like um, blockchain can, can help that. You get rid of the paper records so we have a permanent record of tenure. Um, and then, and also I, I think a real potential is for location services. Um, at, I'm sure some of you have seen these where it's kind of um, find a friend you know, on an app. And so you're a farmer and you um, say, oh, there's another farmer near me, right? Like another person in a restaurant near me and, and say, oh, by the way, where did you get your seeds? Oh, when did you plant? <laughs> oh, you know, do you have irrigation and such? And so I think that community based um, self-support is really important. Thanks, Doug. I'm really glad you mentioned the gender, critical gender angle here um, and, and some roles that technology can play. Sarah, any comments either on, on this issue of connectivity or um, I'd love to hear in WFP's work to what extent gender comes into this. And, and um, I'm sure you all are looking at that issue closely as well. Um. Well, in terms of um, the connectivity issue, I mean, it's always an ongoing challenge, and especially when you're dealing with uh, satellite data sets that may have the tendency to be quite heavy. So we are, you know, working on solutions. How can we deliver the same information in a lighter format? So we have a couple of different options for this, like, you know, producing summary infographics with the key pieces of information that our users need to, need to access um, if they're unable to go to the platform, which can be quite heavy on, on the bandwidth. And then um, I, I have to say, I'm not uh, 
so much of an ex expert position to answer on gender quality in WFB. I seem to be very <laughs> narrowed in on, uh, on aims in the remote sensing. So I'll leave that for my colleagues to contribute. Yeah, that's fair. And um, I, I did just remind everyone in the chat that I want to see your questions as well. Um, but, you know, Doug mentioned gender, which I, I'm glad we covered, um, or perhaps more, more to cover on that front, but it does kind of bring me to this question I mentioned at the outset when it comes to ensuring that uh, these tools and the benefits of these tools don't remain out of reach for the people who can most benefit, um, whether it is uh, women, whether it is smallholder farmers in low and middle income countries, many of them women, um, you know, thinking about those who are most vulnerable to um, issues like climate change, issues like the impact of COVID um, on food security, on nutrition. Uh, I want to make sure that in our conversation, we're not just talking about what large agencies are doing, um, what governments are doing, but how these most vulnerable individuals are are seeing the benefits and using these tools. So um, when it comes to access and inclusion, can you all share a little bit more about um, either what you're doing on that front or what more needs to happen on that front? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll bite. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's multifaceted and, and difficult. We all know the connectivity issue. Um, we. I, I always worry about an arguable faith in technology that if we just wait, there's a technology that's going to fix it. So all, all of the new um, space-based um, web services and, 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 and such, uh, I don't think we should wait for that. Um, one advancement is in cloud computing. And so, I mean, 10 years ago, I was going into labs and they're going, oh, we're going to need servers, we're going to need this. And I'm like, no, you're going to need keystrokes. That's all, we don't have to download the data, it's all there, we have the tools. And especially, um, we, we have the, the, the training. And so at, at, at FAO, my team always um, laughs because I go, you know, we don't do anything <laughs> in, in our lab, um, which is partly true because what we're trying to do is um, support the, the, the nations and ministries and NGOs and and, um, and and other groups to do to do the work. So hopefully we'll all be out of a job soon. Um, but then, yeah, I mean some of these um, weather alerts, especially. I mean it's always tragic to hear about that if they had only known that you know this storm was coming and such. So I think it's a it, it, it's a real um, challenge to do that. And so. Yeah, maybe the, the, the technology is is coming around, um, and and also it highlights the need for um, supporting the national um, spatial data infrastructure, geospatial infrastructure, um, and the communications infrastructure um, to to make sure that those are in 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 place. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. And can you expand on that a little bit when you talk about the national geospatial infrastructure? You know, we've mentioned NGOs working in this space, governments working in this space, but there's a lot of variation country by country, I would assume. So just so I understand, um, you know, Carolina, I know you can speak mostly to Mozambique in particular. Um, Doug and Sarah, you're working across many country contexts. Uh, does the success or failure of your project um, depend in large part on that national commitment to GIS? I just want to better understand what role governments play. Well, it's it's it, it's the national um, spatial data infrastructure, but it's also the national statistics, um, and it's also geospatial in, in general. I'm working in, in countries where the um, big issue is they don't have street addresses, so they can't get an Amazon package because there's no street number. And so there actually are Carolina out there, you know, with the, um, the, the um, surveying instruments and, 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 and such trying to develop that um, yeah. with, with them. Great, yeah, that's helpful. I think, just to, I'm just I think that, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Carolina. I, I think there's also for the private sector to play here. And, you know, one, I think I'm gonna turn off my bio. There. Okay. I think there's also a role for the private sector to play here. Um, and one of the things that we are seeing is um, some of these technologies that are 
you know, you buy it off the box, particularly for, for more sophisticated farmers, but there's also the potential for farm advisory services, um, the art to smallholders or to not necessarily the most vulnerable, clearly, because they, they have certain limitations in terms of access cash, but, um, but some, some more, more sophisticated, what we call emergent farmer types, they, I think they would be willing and, and, and there's evidence that they would be willing to pay for, for a service that provides them specific agronomic advice. Obviously, you know, the, the fees have to be additive, but, but there's definitely interest there. Um, so I think both government and private sector have a role to play to increase in access to, these, to this information. Absolutely. And this week with the UN General Assembly tends to focus quite a bit on public-private partnerships. So I'm glad uh, you brought that point up. I have some questions coming in. Love to see it. Thank you and keep them coming. Um, here's a great question. And it kind of builds on what I was just asking about uh, ensuring that those who can most benefit from these tools, um, what I had asked is actually know how to use these tools, but I, I love this uh, framing. So one of our attendees says, I'd be interested to know more on what work is done to understand what people want. For example, um, if we don't want tools to remain out of reach to people such as smallholder farmers, what work is done to understand their perspectives and understand what solutions they think would solve their problems, uh, bringing them on the journey of developing solutions. So I think that's a great way to put it. Doug, it looks like you might want to jump in on that. Yeah, if you're reading my notes somehow. Um, because I'm supposed to answer one thing that we can do, and it's exactly what I've written. Give them what they want. There are too many times where people walk in to the ministry and the labs and go, I've got exactly what you want. And, and I, I had a minister of, of climate in, in one country goes, if, if you're going to come here and try to sell me something, just leave now. And I'm like, no, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm here. I'm um, FAO, our joke is I'm here to help. Um, and, and so, yes. And, and so we really need to do a better job of understanding exactly what they need and what, and what time frame, what formats, um, et, et, et cetera, because we've seen this too often of just bringing something and I've got this new, you know, um, software package that'll do this, this, that, and everything. They don't understand. And sometimes it's not even in a, in a um, appropriate language and, and such. So that's a really good question. But now I have to think of one more thing for my final statement. <laughs> yeah, you're on the hook. Well, we can always revisit that point. I think it's an important point. Give them what they want. Um, but Sarah, along those lines, I, I wonder how does WFP look at this, not just bringing in solutions, you know, powered by geospatial data, as it relates to hunger, but understanding what people want and ensuring that your efforts are in response to those um, desires. I think it's really important that before you embark on selling a, a project or a service, yeah, you have to ask your customers or the user, the end users, what do they even need rather than trying to fit uh, a solution kind of a, around them kind of, you know, ask them what they need and then work from that point backwards to develop the, the appropriate solution. So we, we try to make our best effort to understand our country office, office uh, end user needs and survey them to the best ability we can. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, and Carolina, anything to add on that? And I know your camera off because of connectivity issues, but um, anything in terms of understanding um, what those who can most benefit from these tools actually want to use these tools for and how does that work in your work in Mozambique? Well, no, I, I think that it's a, it's a question to, to, before you design these programs, it, you need to understand the user and what their specific needs are. I mean, in our, in our specific case, we have seen our experiences that the interest is information around climate, obviously, um, because of you know, the, the, the frequency in which we're experiencing climate web, climate related events. And then pest control, identifying pests and, 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 and figure out how to combat them. We, I know, I think that you, the, we've talked a lot about the, the, the lo locust, but we've had a, a tremendous attack of the whole armyworm in this side of the world. 
and um, and have been very vocal about needing assistance in identifying when this is happening so that they can be proactive in, in, in treating that and not losing their crops. Yeah, another great example. Thank you, Carolina. Um, well, that brings me to another question we have um, from one of our attendees, and um, it's related to D GIS for disaster resilience among farmers, um, which of course uh, examples might include pests, um, examples might include COVID-19, um, examples might include climate change, and there are many more. But the question is, how are you using GIS for disaster resilience among farmers? For example, early warning systems or index-based insurance. Um, so I know Doug mentioned earlier uh, the sentiment of, if only I had known. Um, so that kind of gets to early warning systems. Um, Carolina, I know some of your work has to do with insurance, so would love to hear more about that. Um, but maybe we'll start with Doug, GIS for disaster resilience, and then go to Carolina. Yeah, sure. Um, it's, it's a, again, a, a infrastructure question. And so um, countries we're working in, um, for example, Somalia um, has over the last poof, uh, uh, five or six years um, has developed a swallow on the Somalian water and land information system. And so I'm the lead technical officer there. And so I, I, um, I know a bit about meteorological um, stations. And, and so they've installed an, an entire network and maintain them and, and hydrological stations, um, groundwater and surface models. And I always like to use that as an exemplar of, you know, we can take this and actually other countries um, are asking for our support in, in, in doing that. But um, it, it, it is compounded a, a bit and it makes it an interesting statistical sampling problem is that um, in some places we um, access is economically restrictive and security wise restrictive. Um, and so we need to do a, a more thorough job of um, integrating the, the field-based observations with the satellite-based observations. Um, and again, it's a communications thing too, because uh, we're not going to be running wires to all these um, hydro met stations and, and such. So um, sometimes we'll need to put in a radio um, communications for, the, for those. So um, yeah, it, it's, um, and, and there are a lot of the, the, the forecasts that, that we that we get are are, are getting better and better, um, but still, as you mentioned, um, Catherine, it's you know how do you actually get that you know alert on your phone and saying um, you know there's a, a hurricane or a flood coming down the um, the, the water. Mm -hmm. So I think the models are improving. That's good to hear. Um, Carolina, what about, you know, this attendee asked uh, specifically about insurance, and I know that's a part of what you do. So can you expand on that? Yeah, sure. Um, we just started this about three years ago. Um, the program that we have is in partnership with one of the, the, the insurance companies here. And what we're doing is we are promoting weather index seed insurance. And the way it works is that a farmer goes to an agro dealer that is registered through our program. They pick up uh, their purchase, their seed, and then they register seed according to we have a system of agroecological zones and that's registered in central database and there's a satellite system that uh, tracks um weather event in the different agroecological zones that we have defined and if there's a weather event that's or if this triggers a weather event then all of the farmers that are, have purchased seed have the right to go pick up new seed packages this is still a pilot we're trying to see if we can move it to farmers getting actual cash payouts. Um, but it's been really well, well received so far. And again, given the recent exposure cyclone, and we've had a couple of other cyclones in the area since um, there's a lot of intra initiatives of the sort from farmers and private sector as well. Great, thanks Carolina. Bringing in another question here. Um, and I appreciate this question because at, at the outset uh, I mentioned uh, the potential for GIS across all the, these issue areas um, and someone wants specific examples, which I do hope we walk away with. And, and here's a question on GIS and precision agriculture. So the question is, um, how do we use GIS for precision agriculture? 
Um, how do we use this imagery for crop monitoring and yield forecasting? So I wonder, Sarah, if that's something you might be able to speak to? Yeah, I can certainly touch on um, particularly the, the crop monitoring. So at WFP, we do have a crop monitoring initiative um, where we um, you have to collect some field data, but then the it's called Sen2 Agri, and there's another system that we've built upon um, a bit where we're able to basically predict or estimate the, the main uh, crops in a particular area in, in the country. And then each year, as you get the new updated satellite imagery coming in, then you're supposed to, um, then this is updated. So it's dynamic. So previously, um, back in the day, some of the crop type maps, they were static, they were done once, and you would have to go back to the field to recollect uh, all your data again. But now with the power of satellite imagery and that we do have more frequent collection and that the computing power is improving, there is the opportunity for these products to become available. So it's something WFP is working on. They've run a couple, we've run, run a couple of pilot projects so far. Um, on being in South Sudan, and I think actually in Mozambique, um, we're working on that too. Thank you, Sarah. And I'm loving these questions. We're um, nearing the end of our hour together. So I would encourage you to keep the questions coming. And if for some reason we can't get to them, which we may not be able to, we'll try and relay them to our panelists um, or maybe come up with other ways to, to get back to you. Uh, it's great to see this kind of engagement. But I wanna make sure we conclude by looking ahead. Um, so, you know, I've been a part of the UN General Assembly many years in a row now. I'm sure you all have been parts of these conversations uh, year after year as well. And we all hope for real progress uh, in these conversations and progress on the goals. So I'd love to hear from each of you. Uh, and this is where um, Doug mentioned he, he, he may be able to revisit his point, give them what they want, or he might have a new thought here. Um, but I do want to hear what is one thing you want to see happen between this UN General Assembly and next year's UN General Assembly in order to really accelerate the role that geospatial data is playing in addressing hunger? So what's one thing that needs to happen? Your call to action, if you will. Um, I'll, I'll go to Doug last. I'll maybe start with Carolina, if that's okay. Yeah, sure, well, I have a thing, <laughs> actually. And they are, I think, you know, we need to push and support governments to, to make these um, technologies an integral part of their, of their system, particularly around um, agricultural production and, and early warning their events. And then the second thing is, I think we really need to be much more welcoming and sort of private sector engagement in these types of initiatives. Um, because I think, I mean, all the work that we do is pretty, is pretty close with private sector actors, and I definitely see a role for them to be service providers and advisors using these tools and, and that for, for smallholder farmers. Great. And hopefully conversations like these can help to facilitate that. Sarah, do you want to jump in? What's one thing that needs to change? Um, I think especially from um, the AIMS perspective, and we are big consumers of commercial imagery for the humanitarian sector needs improved access to commercial satellite imagery. And um, that means some of the bureaucracy has to be dealt with so we can, can access it and pay for it. Um, but that has been a very, that's been quite a challenge in the last couple of years of running AIMS. Thanks, Sarah. Great points. And Doug, we'll go back to you. What's one thing you'd like to see change? Okay. Um, I, I really wish I heard the, the band. I didn't see it yet. Um, so um, I, I understand there was over a million people who dialed in to hear, uh, what is it, KTS, the, the K-pop band at the General Assembly yesterday? Oh, I missed this. You wish you had heard them, you said? Yeah, I mean, I'll go back and, and, and find it, but it's, it's, it's really great that they have a, um, ambassadors that are K-pop. Um, so I, I guess I'll, I'll try to relife what I said about give them um, what they want. Um, as, as far as the work that, that we do with the um, UN GGIM, UN Geospatial, the experts working group, um, 
Um, we maintain as a, as a group, the 14 fundamental UN data layers and, and, and such. I, I think that those efforts are going really well. There's a new Chinese center for geodesy, um, center of excellence for geodesy, et, et cetera. Um, but, and, and I will take this on personally to, um, to say, okay, how do we tie this down to this local level of the understanding the actual requirements, not something um, necessarily from Rome or, or, or New York or, or, or what have you. I think it's really important. We've done some, you know, a lot of outreach and um, stock taking and, and what are the requirements and things, and it's, and it's a big job, but we really need to understand exactly what they want because otherwise we're gonna give them pistachio ice cream and they want vanilla. Thank you. Love it. Thank you, Doug. Um, and, you know, our task today uh, was to really emerge with understanding why geospatial technologies are such powerful tools in the fight against hunger and not just in theory, but in practice, what this really looks like. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, this is part of a series. We'll be re revisiting um, the role of geospatial data across other aspects of the SDGs. But um, I, I would just love to hear any final reflections from any of you, just a take home point you want our audience to walk away with when it comes to why these technologies are such powerful tools. I just wanna provide that space. If you had any final thoughts you wanted to add. Well, I'll go back to what um, Clint said at the opening is that engage, um, you know, so pick an SDG and, and, an, and an indicator and, and say, I'm gonna know this and I'm gonna to contribute to it because that's what it is all about. It's the voluntary contributions um, to making the world a better place and ultimately getting to what, you know, what we're supposed to be doing with SDG two is um, zero hunger. Great, Carolina, Sarah, just wanna provide the space, no pressure, but any takeaways from your end or takeaways you hope the audience has when it comes to the promise of these tools for hunger? I mean, I just think that, I mean, I'm a, I'm a geek and I love satellite imagery, remote sensing, and it is a really powerful tool and uh, you can do so many things with it and we need improved access. So, so everyone, no matter which country they're in, that they can access it too, and they can be in, engaged in the GIS community as well. Thanks, Sarah. Carolina, let's hope your connection holds up with us. Any any final thoughts from you? I think I mean I I would second what Sarah was saying and what Doug was saying that that you know we just need to work towards increasing expansion and and make these tools more available to people. Great, and and speaking of. Uh, being engaged um, at, as Doug sort of issued as, as a call to action. It looks like we have a very engaged group. Um, and so in terms of, uh, I see some questions in the chat about um, the report I mentioned at the beginning. Um, just circling back to what I mentioned at the beginning, that was the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World report. Um, and it was produced by the FAO and other partners. Um, and there was another question in the chat about where you all can view this video online if you missed the beginning or if you wanna share it with friends or colleagues. Um, I think my colleagues can post here in this chat for you uh, where you can watch this recording later. Um, we have a, a URL where this will be posted. Uh, and just a few other notes from me as we wrap up here. Um, I wanna go ahead and thank Esri for partnering with us on this event and making it possible. And we'll be hosting the second event in this series of three events on geospatial data and the SDGs next month in October. That one will be focused on harnessing geospatial data for SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities. I also want to invite you all to tune in to our coverage of UNGA this week. I mentioned this is part of our broader UNGA 76 coverage. And that coverage will begin tomorrow, beginning at 8 a.m. Eastern time. So we hope you'll tune in. Um, you'll see here in the chat, uh, a little bit more about um, how GIS supports the SDGs uh, and where you can find the recording to this conversation. Finally, I wanna thank our panelists, Doug, Carolina, Sarah, thanks to Clint who joined us earlier. It, I really enjoyed learning more and I, I look forward to following your work. Thank you all. Thank you, Catherine, and thank everyone for being here. Bye everyone.